Merry Christmas to you. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday. I hope that you're having these grand, wonderful parties and celebrations with your family and that, uh, that life is good for you. But if it's not, if things aren't perfect for you, just know you're, you're not alone. In fact, that's as, kind of the message I wanted to share tonight is what do you do when things aren't perfect? I want to share with you a scripture that, that goes along with our theme tonight. It comes from Proverbs 17. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. There's a great translation of this one. A good, it's called the Good News Translation. It says, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It's a slow death to be gloomy all the time. And it really is. I, and I go over, I, I get to speak all over the country and it's fun to speak to children because they'll laugh at almost anything. It's fun to speak to teenagers because their brains aren't fully developed. They'll laugh quite a bit. It's adults that are sometimes difficult to speak to. Not women. Women are polite. They'll laugh because they see that you're trying to be funny. But sometimes men, they're very difficult to speak to. They don't, they don't like to laugh. They'll keep their arms folded and kind of stare at you. Did you know that children laugh on average 400 times per day and adults, it's just 15. What happened? Was it the mortgage? Was it the children? What happened? And I think we could probably as adults take this message to heart. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. It doesn't ever say Merry Christmas in scriptures, but it does say a merry heart. And one way to keep Christmas in our heart is to keep our heart merry, to keep, to keep laughing, to keep smiling. I think part of the problem is we make decisions that hurt our lives and then it ends up, we, we're, we end up a little bit unhappy, right? Like, look at this girl right here. She's making a bad decision. That is a bad choice. And we have all made bad choices. Maybe you've made a bad choice similar to this one where you ended up kissing something you shouldn't, where you didn't know he was a pig until later. I get it. One girl put this on, on Instagram. If I was under mistletoe, who would kiss me? No, judging by your spelling. One girl made a, a poor decision. She didn't even know it. Have you ever made a bad decision? You didn't even know it. It's just a single letter, but it made a big difference. I have been a good girl. Die, Santa. Oh, goodness. Probably not the message she wanted to send. It was just it was just a mistake. This kid's taking quite a risk here. Look at this kid. He says, Dear Santa, how are you? I'm good. Here's what I want for Christmas. HTTP colon backslash backslash www.amazon.com. He types out the entire thing. And man, he is probably just one letter away from getting a toaster or something. Just taking quite a risk there for Christmas. And then have you ever had one job? Just one job. This is all you needed to do and you couldn't, you couldn't do it. You made a mistake. It seems like that's what happens. That's, that's why we sometimes can't have a merry heart is we make poor decisions that lead to our heart not being merry. But I was thinking, could we, could we choose to be happier? Could we choose to have a merry heart? I did a little research on this. Did you know that just, just the act of smiling can do so much for you? Smiling can make you happier. The physical act of smiling actually activates pathways in your brain that influence your emotional state. You can actually trick your mind into entering a state of happiness. Just one smile, according to British researchers, can provide the same level of brain stimulation as up to 2,000 bars of chocolate. Give it a try. Try just the physical act of smiling. It might seem kind of creepy, but just try it anyway. Just smile here while we go through all these, all these reasons to smile. Just keep those muscles smiling and see if it doesn't activate some of these happiness pathways. Did you know that you'll live longer? There was a study done on baseball card photos, and they found that the plan of a, a player's smile could predict the plan of the span of their life. Sorry, the span of the player's smile could predict the span of their life. Players who didn't smile in their pictures lived an average of 72.9 years, but players with beaming smiles lived an average of 79.9 years. A big difference. That's seven extra years because of smiling. You'll boost your immune system and reduce your stress. Apparently, if you smile, it, it is associated with reducing stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, reduced anxiety, and increased health and mood enhancing hormones like endorphins and dopamine. And you can even lower your blood pressure. Did you know that smiling makes you look younger? A 2016 study conducted at the University of Missouri said that it's that muscles use the muscles that we use to smile lift the face appearing, making, let's see, making, making people be categorized as 10 years younger than their actual age. Give it a try. 
Give it a try. Smile. You, you'll get more promotions. Research has shown that people who smile regularly appear more confident and sociable or more likely to get promotions. Do you know that if you smile, you'll improve your relationships? By measuring the smiles in photographs, researchers are able to predict how fulfilling and long last marriages are and their general well-being and happiness. Smiling makes your voice sound friendly, warm, and receptive. Don't you want to sound that way when you're talking to your spouse or your family? Sound, do you want to sound friendly, warm, and receptive? Did you know that you'll make others smile? One research out of Sweden suggests that smiling is more contagious than the flu. When someone smiles at you, you're hardwired to smile back. It's an infectious loop of happiness. So if you're with people right now, give it a try. Smile at them. Smile at left and right and see what happens. See if it doesn't make you feel better. See if it doesn't make them feel better. Just that physical act of smiling. You can see why the scripture says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine right? It's a healing, it's a healing thing to do, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Being cheerful keeps you healthy. It's a slow death to be gloomy all the time. One thing I think we need to watch out for during Christmas time is our expectations versus our reality. John Maxwell said, disappointment is the gap that exists between expectation and reality, especially around Christmas time. Sometimes we heighten our expectations to the point where we're going to always end up disappointed. Have you ever made a, a snowman and just had a certain expectation in your mind and the way it turned out just wasn't exactly according to your expectation? You ended up having a kind of a miserable experience because you thought, oh, this should look better than it does. Oh, or decorating the Christmas tree. Sometimes you have certain expectations of how it's going to be and then it doesn't turn out that way. Or with getting a present wrapped right? Something under the tree. You have this expectation of these crisply, beautifully wrapped packages when sometimes someone doesn't have time for that. And all they can find is pink duct tape. I don't know why someone would have pink duct tape, but it was handy enough. We, we do this with children all the time. We place certain expectations on children that during Christmas time, they'll be happy and cute. And sometimes they are not neither happy nor cute, right? We just want to get that perfect family photo. Look, it's a perfect family photo. No, it's not. It is not a perfect family photo. We want our children to look happy almost all the time during Christmas and to be happy all the time when really they're just kind of bugged. All right. This kid is totally adorable. And now this kid is totally bothered by his family. And you might say, oh, why do everyone else's children look so perfect during Christmas? Perfect, perfect Christmas photos. And yet here's my kids. All right. Not looking happy at all. I get it. I get why some people give up entirely and they just say, you know what? You be the smiley one. You be the Christmas one. You be the cheery one. I'm not going to be happy. But we can we can make sure that we're just careful with our expectations. We can say, okay, where are my expectations? What is reality likely to be? And how can I get those two to match up so I don't end up disappointed? What happens when you want to have joy, but you don't have all that much joy? Well, says Elder Joseph B. Worthland, the first thing you can do is learn to laugh. He asks, have you ever seen an angry driver who, when someone else makes a mistake, reacts as though that person has insulted his honor and his family and his dog and his ancestors all the way back to Adam? Or have you ever had an encounter with an overhanging cupboard door left open at the wrong place in the wrong time, which has been cursed, condemned, and avenged by the sore-headed victim? There's an antidote for times like, like these. You learn to laugh. Can you try it? Learn to laugh. Learn to smile. He said, I remember when one of our daughters went on a blind date. She was all dressed up and waiting for her date to arrive when the doorbell rang. In walked a man who seemed a little old, but she tried to be polite. We watched as the, she got into the car, but the car didn't move. Eventually, our daughter got out of the car and red-faced ran back into the house. Why? Because the man she thought was her blind date had actually come up to pick had actually come to pick up another of our daughters who had agreed to be a babysitter for him and his wife. Oh, how embarrassing, how terrible. He said, we all had a good laugh over that. In fact, we couldn't stop laughing. Later, when our daughter's real blind date showed up, I couldn't come out to meet him because I was still in the kitchen laughing. Now I realize that our daughter could have felt humiliated and embarrassed, but she laughed with us. Notice that she laughed with us. And as a result, we still laugh about it today. Elder Worthland finishes the next time you're tempted to groan, you might try to laugh instead. You're going to be tempted to groan because of the disappointment sometimes of Chris of the Christmas season, but instead try to laugh. It will extend your life and make the lives of all, make the lives of all those around you more enjoyable. 
I was thinking about our theme of keeping Christmas in our heart and having a merry heart. And, and I thought to myself, who is someone that has a merry heart? Who is someone that I've been around who makes me smile and makes me laugh? And I, I remember one of my, one of my good friends, her name was Chris, Kristen Belcher. Some of you have probably heard of Chris. She's an author and she was an author and speaker before she passed away. But whenever she was around, I was smiling. Whenever she was around, I was laughing. And yet she had suffered quite a bit during her life. So many things that she could be disappointed or frustrated or even angry about, she wasn't. When she was just a little baby, she had cancer on both of her on both of her eyes, both of her retinas. And the radiation treatment caused some of the bones and tissue around her eyes to grow differently than than you or I. Let me show you a picture of Chris. This is Chris when she's a little bit, a little bit older. So you, she, when I first met her, she said, don't you just love my beautiful hourglass shape? It's every girl's dream. She would try to make others laugh and she would try to smile. That, that smile of hers was absolutely and totally genuine. You can see she has a prosthetic over her right eye. She could only see out of her right eye for many, many years until one day the cancer returned and took all of her vision from her. And I remember her asking me, she said, Hank, what do you think you'd look at if you knew you only had 10 days left to see? And I never even thought thought about that. Like, what, what, what would I look at? What, 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 what would I, what would be important to me if I had, if I had 10 days left to see? Because that's what they gave her. They gave her 10 days before they needed to take her right eye. She said, oh, I wanted to look at color. I was going to miss color. And and her children. She had two. She had two boys, Christopher and Benji. This is this is them right here. Um, she had these two boys, and she said, "Oh, I knew how blessed I was because I was going to be able to grow up with them, or I was going to be able to be with them as they grow up." Excuse me, but I wanted to see them grow up, you know. And that's the blessing that I hadn't even never thought of before. A blessing that I have of of seeing, the blessing of of sight. And Chris always tried to make tried to make us laugh. When when she was around as and we would get around as speakers, she would tell stories. She told one story about how she spoke at a an assembly and a little girl apparently had her hand up the entire assembly and she said I just I don't think she understood the point of learning about what it was like to be blind in this assembly. And one of the teachers finally said, "Oh, Chris, there's a little girl here with a question." And Chris said, "Yes." And the little girl said, "Ma'am, how do you drive?" And she said, instead of getting offended and telling her, you know, blind people don't drive, I just told her that I have a big long cane and I wave it around the front of the car on the freeway. And if I hit another car, I just swerve. And she said, oh, she said, this little girl went, oh, okay, no big deal. Another little boy said, ma'am, how do you watch TV? And she said, I just feel the TV. I just put my hands up against the TV and I feel the people moving around. And the little boy said, oh, okay. She would just make you make you laugh like that. I remember one time she told me about how she went to get a drink at church. And she said, I listened for someone slurping at the drinking fountain and I couldn't hear anybody slurping at the drinking fountain. So I I decided that nobody was there and I went to get a drink. So she said, I put my hands down, hoping to feel that hard metal bar, you know, so I could get a drink. And she said, instead, I felt something really big and squishy. And I heard the oldest man in our ward go. And she said, oh, goodness, what was he doing? Why was he not getting a drink? And she backed up and covered her face. And she even laughed at that. She said, Hank, why did I cover my eyes? Why did I cover my eyes? I was blind. But she said, oh, I'm so sorry, Brother Johansson. Are you OK? And he said, I am now. Right. She just wanted us. She just wanted us to laugh. She wanted us to to take part in the joy that she experienced um, in, in her heart and in her mind. She had this, this merry heart. And to her, I think it truly was a medicine. And it was a medicine for all those people around her. Well, before she passed away, Chris wrote a book called Hard Times and Holy Places. And I wanted to show you, I want to finish today with what she said. She said this, no one schedules adversity. We don't look at our daily planners and say, today I'll drop the kids off at school, go grocery shopping, get a fatal disease, pick up the dry cleaning, have marital problems, and take dinner to sister so-and-so. If I have time, maybe I could lose my job or my house could burn down. Or should I put that off until tomorrow? In this mortal world, we have no need to schedule trials. They just come. And I know that's happened to you. She said, don't allow your heart to be hardened by hard times. 
Now, I know coming from me, you might say, oh, Hank, you've never seen hard times like I have. But my friend Chris has. She has seen the hardest of times. She's dealt with spinal meningitis multiple times, having cancer, having gone blind, the pain associated with all the surgeries and, and all the pain and difficulty that has come with, with the, 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 the health problems that she's had. And yet she still says to you and I, don't allow your heart to be hardened by hard times. Make the choice to turn to Christ. There is purpose in your suffering. You and I are being changed, remodeled, stretched, and polished for eternal glory. If we trust in and choose Christ amid our difficulties, our hard times will become holy. She talks about going blind. She said, I wish I could comfort the woman I was five years ago. I wish I could hold her in my arms and promise her that she would make it. Can you hear the you from the future kind of yelling back through the through time, through decades of time, through years of time, that the pain is going to subside? I would tell her she's going to smile. She's even going to laugh again. I may have lost my sight, but my vision has never been clearer. As I was thinking about this, keeping Christmas in your heart and having a merry heart, I couldn't help but think of my friend, Chris. I found this quote from Elder Soares. And I thought Chris would, Chris would like this because this was, this was her. The Savior's life was the perfect example of love and goodwill towards men. As we turn our hearts outward like the Savior did, and that's what Chris did. When things got hard inward, she turned her heart outward. And I know that things were difficult for her. And, and she, was, she wasn't shy about that. She wasn't shy about letting, letting her friends know that when things were difficult, when things were hard. But she still turned her heart outward. As we turn our hearts outward like the Savior did, I promise that we can better experience the meaning of Christmas. And I leave that message with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 